Wow, okay. Way to make me feel welcome. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm Edmund Jackson. I'm a, an independent consultant. I do statistical stuff and data analysis. I'm here to talk about uh, doing that uh, in, in closure, so data science in closure. So let's start by defining our terms. Um, what is data science, or what is a data scientist? And uh, a wag on Twitter once said that a data scientist is an analyst who happens to live in California. And uh, I think there's a lot of mileage to be had in that one, actually. Um, but there, there is something new, and there's something very old as well. Let's start with the old, because this is closure, like, like our roots. Um, when you think back to what, what, what would data science be, in fact, it's that realm of endeavor that requires simultaneously uh, advanced computational and statistical methods. So you have to do both of these things together at the same time. And I think that's sort of the defining thing. And if you define it that way, uh, you think that, you know, Alan Turing, he started the whole of computer science for this very purpose. I mean, he was trying to decode German codes in real time, um, you know, under conditions of bomb-falling duress. And that was what, what inspired him. It wasn't lolcats, you know. It might be hard to believe when you see the internet these days. But that was the start of it. And, you know, this tradition has continued. Um, things like um, atom smashing at the LHC, or radio astronomy, uh, protein crystallography, all of these are, are scientific endeavors that require both very advanced maths and very advanced computers working together to solve a problem. So it's been around since the beginning. So what's the excitement? What's a new thing? All those examples I've, I've given you have required billion-dollar government research budgets and armies of PhD zealots to solve them. And what's new now is that that's no longer the case. The advent of things like um, computing platforms, which give people very powerful computers to do large-scale calculations, open source platforms like R, which give you the tools to actually perform statistics in the hands of, of every man, and large amounts of data accruing in uh, private companies, as well as being opened up from the public sector to do statistics over. All of this is democratizing this activity, and that's the excitement. It's kind of like the, the early days of Linux, where you know, uh, the stuff came out and people could just hack on it, and you know, you know, the, the original Unix um, high priests had a bit of a giggle up their sleeves, but they were wrong, right? And it's the same here. Like, the stuff is coming out, it's in its early days, and I think it's gonna revolutionize stuff. So, uh, let's, let's talk about analysis, yeah, right? So what are the, how do you summon forth knowledge or understanding from within data? What are the tools, the, sort of the, the sigils of doing that? And, like, the first spell would be Excel. And yeah, I'm, not kind of, I'm not really joking about that. It's like a, an interactive, functional, reactive, programming language with a, an embedded maths DSL and, and graphical capabilities, you know, what's not to like, you know, it's the most widely deployed analytical platform on the planet. The trouble is it's sort of possessed by this demon paperclip who will like turn your floating point numbers <laughs> into dates and like not tell you, right, and uh, they've got a completely opaque computational uh, uh, model, I mean, you know, the spreadsheet now takes 10 minutes to run, why, there's no way to find that out, right. So more serious tools are things like uh, MATLAB, which uh, grew out of linear algebra. It's very good at that, doing that sort of thing fast. It's very big in the engineering community. Uh, Mathematica, which is symbolic manipulation, so symbolic integration, differentiation, that kind of thing. R, which grew out of stats. And then sort of um, more specialist tools like SAS and STATA, but they're not really programmatic. So that's like sort of one group of tools that are used to do analysis. And then the other stuff is like C++. All of the, the heavy lifting is often done in C++, um, and the, you know, the heart of darkness itself, Fortran, which underlies most of the rest of them, in fact. Like, very frequently, if you go deep enough down the stack, you find Fortran there. Okay, so these things solve one part of our problem. So they have like a mathematical abstraction. So they give you an interactive environment. And you know, like that talk we saw yesterday about the uh, the, the neural networks, that's absolutely critical for doing any sort of mathematical exploration. You have to be able to poke your data, prod it, throw some curves up, change it, you know, play with it and see what's going on. You can't do that without it, it's a sine qua non. You need visualization as part of that. Then the actual tools that they provide you, um, things like um, linear algebra, statistics, machine learning, and optimization, all of those are available as libraries in these sorts of platforms. But that's not enough for data science. Data science is more than math, it's, it's data, right? So you have to be uh, part of an environment or a context. Like either you have large amounts of data and you have to get at it, or you're within a business process. So you need more than mathematics. You need to be part of reality, plugged in. And that's a second requirement, which is 
platform. Okay, firstly, you need speed. I mean, that, that goes without saying. But then it's data, 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 right? Um, the analysis, like previous things, like your mathematical platforms, it tends to be a case of someone will give you this box of data, and you go in the corner, and you analyze it, and then you come back, and you tell them the answer. And that's not really applicable for data science, because the data's coming in, and you've got to embed yourself in a business process or keep up with it. And so you have to deal with things like XML. And what are you going to do with XML in MATLAB? You know, put it into a matrix? It's just that sort of, you need zippers, right? You need proper data structures to perform the analysis in its native, native way, it's speak on its proper level. You need ability to get at the data, so proper access to things like databases, queues, REST APIs, all that kind of stuff. This is not really available to something like Mathematica, you just, it just it's not there. Um, in addition, because you're part of a larger context, you're not hiding in the corner with your box of data, you need to have end-to-end uh, -end quality control. So uh, things like tests, integration, deployment, monitoring. So data science requires both, right? You need the mathematical stuff and you need the platform stuff. And that's sort of not really available in your traditional things. I mean, they kind of segregate out like that. And the reason is our demon friend complexity, right? So if you're working in C++ and you're having to worry about buffer overruns, um, you can't be worrying about the condition number of your matrix at the same time. You just, you know, very few people have the mental capacity to do that. They exist, but they're kind of rare. So, on the other hand, if you're working in Mathematica and it's given you the tools to perform a numeric integration, I mean a symbolic integration, it probably doesn't give you handles to make that thing fast or to get to the grips, to get to the nitty gritty, because it's hidden it away from you. So compromises have been made and it sort of, it separates out according to that curve. The more platform power you get, the less analytical power you get and vice versa. So you have this situation, you have two layers, you want to get to the top. Analytical stuff gets you halfway up, so you can analyze your data and get an answer, but now you can't scale it out. On the other hand, you've got your C++. If you have your answer, you can scale it up and, and do useful things, but how do you get it, right? And, you know, this was me for a long time trying to solve that problem. <laughs> now, this is a crying need, so obviously there is an existing answer, and that answer is, is Python. The Python community has really stepped into this. They've got a really nice uh, virtual machine, which gives you good access to databases, and it's also has strong libraries like NumPy and SciPy that give you good uh, analytical capabilities. So they're really like forging ahead and they're getting a good following in this particular domain for that reason, because they're sort of in that sweet spot. But you know, the serpent is never to be trusted. And the, the reason, <laughs> yeah, I like Python really. Uh, the reason is this, I mean, what's the difference between this and this? I mean, you know, Kevin will be into that. I mean, it's all about typography, right? Written like that, that's LaTeX, right? I'm talking about maths. There I'm talking about programming. And this is like, it's subtle, and it's indicative of a, a fundamental rift in, in the ideology. In something like a, a, pro, a, a ideology? Wow. Uh, in a programming language, sorry, in mathematics, this makes sense if and only if x is an infinite value. It does make sense. If x is infinite, that, that's true. In an imperative language, that makes sense whenever x is a number, and in Perl, whenever x is anything, right? <laughs> so, the point is, like, putting aside like, differences between equality and assignment, I know these are different things, there's a fundamental disagreement between the, the, mod, the domain you're, you're trying to think about, which is mathematics, and its mode of expression in a language. And that's a difficulty. When you're working in an imperative language, you're doing this, you're building the machine to solve the problem rather than um, solving the problem itself on its own terms. So you're saying, you're trying to decide how is this machine going to work. You know, the lever turns three and a half degrees and it shoots the toast up to the toucan and I'm not sure what happens next. But the, the, the point is you, what you program is a machine. It's a description of a process and, and, and the nitty gritty thereof rather than being in the domain of your problem which is the mathematics itself. So it's like logic programming. You want to be in the domain of the logic describing the logical operators rather than the search itself. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that, you know, it's got mutable data. So I won't spend long, where this is like old, old hat here. But it's like, you have this data, but people can change it, so you, you worry they're gonna squish it. So you can't hand it around, so you lock it up into something, and you hand that around. But now people can't get the data, so you have to get them somewhere to get the data, which you've just locked away. And so you, you build these elaborate patterns, and I use that word quite specifically, around the data. And what you end up with is like, um, this um, Fabergé egg with, with, with a toffee center at the middle. And the, the problem is that that's like giving yourself extra trouble to deal with. You want to deal with the data as data, like in its native format. You want maps and hashes and vectors and, and that kind of stuff. So you need to have 
functional programming. I mean, we know the answer to these problems, both of them, because it gives you immutability and it changes the way you're thinking about the problem such that it's closer to the maths. The domain that you're expressing and its mode of expression are much closer together, so it's a natural expression and it makes you more able to deal with mathematical problems. In addition, you have the serious data abstractions. You know, uh, I spoke earlier about zippers for XML, but in any of these sorts of things, you need to have proper ways of dealing with the data on its own terms rather than behind some kind of a wall. So that's solving the mathematical side, but you need that on the platform as well. So you need to have it in some sort of powerful thing that gives you the ability to connect to business processes, data sources, and to have quality. And there's a, a group of languages that satisfy all of this. You know, you know, Clojure's one of them, Scala, F-sharp are a couple of other ones. And the simplicity dividend that they, they yield as a result of being functional allows you to sort of cross this um, event horizon of complexity. And there's a large amount of mileage to be had in learning these things and solving problems like data science with them. Okay, so that's sort of like the, the fundamentals why is like closure intrinsically useful for solving this kind of problem. Down to practicums, you know, what particular things does closure bring to the party? So in, in its native, uh, native closure, you have a bunch of libraries like in Cantor. We saw a lot of that yesterday for throwing up curves, interacting with things, basic statistics, basic linear algebra. This gets you a very long way. Then for like large scale problems, STORM for distributed computation, uh, Cascalog as a nice data log abstraction over uh, Hadoop, uh, Datomic for bringing the data into your process so that you can handle it like locally. And there's a bunch of other stuff, but these are like the, the leaders. Now, if you're trying to solve a problem and your library doesn't exist in Clojure, you can reach out to the JVM and get it there. And what, what, what exists there for, for data science type problems? Well, I've mentioned Hadoop already, but it's closed over by Cascalog, so you wouldn't want to like use that natively. Uh, Mahout, or Mahout, Mahout, I don't know how it's pronounced. That's um, uh, machine learning on Hadoop, and that's available on Java, uh, and you can get to it easily from, from Clojure, and there are a couple of really fun blog posts about that. The, the, the good part about that is, is you can run that from within your Clojure system, call out to Mahout, get it to do the analysis, bring back the numbers, and see them in your graphs, in your interactive environment. And like natively, you can't do that, and that's really powerful. Weka is a, a long-standing machine learning package uh, from, I think it's Waikato University in, in New Zealand, which has got lots of very good uh, machine learning type things. There are others like in COG and stuff out there. JBLAS is linear algebra. Uh, it's a very nice uh, compromise between calling out to uh, Fortran on the native platform and keeping things in Java. So, you know, uh, Zach was speaking yesterday about the difficulties of this, and I don't really know that much about it, but it's massively difficult. When you want to move numbers off the JVM in order to get native speed, you have to copy them out, and that's like an order n operation. So for, for linear time things, you keep them on the JVM and solve them in Java. Um, and if it doesn't exist on the JVM, what you're trying to do, everything talks to the JVM, so you can take one step further out and use a JNI. Uh, something like R in Cant is a good example. You can actually like, take your closure data, push it across to, to R, get the analysis done in R, and then pull it back in again. I mean, there's a massive performance penalty, and not many people are using it, so it's a little bit shaky at the moment, but it exists, and I've used it successfully for real problems. Right, so Clojure solves all these problems. It gives you everything. There are a few things that are missing, like optimizers. You know, we don't have really a good answer for optimizers yet, uh, but your tools are there, your mathematical side is there, and your platform is there. It gives you speed, uh, good language constructs, good data, uh, abstractions, and concretions. So it's a good answer, right? So, okay. That's like part one of the talk, sort of like the, the hand wavy, everything is awesome. But uh, you know, let's actually like get down to some brass tacks and, and, and see some code. So um, I'm gonna start by going into one of my, my favorite tools from information theory, which is uh, entropy. And it's, uh, it's not very widely used, uh, as far as I can tell, and I thought it would be a fun crowd. I thought you might enjoy a bit of a, an adventure in that. So let's start with, with English money. It's, uh, it's different to American money. Uh, it's worth more for a start. <laughs> But more than that, because um, when you flick an English coin, it comes up heads 60% of the time. And the reason is because Her Majesty's profile is on there, and she exerts a certain royal prerogative to be seen more frequently. <laughs> right, so if we're playing a gambling game with English money, and I'm flicking the coin, I'm gonna say, you know, what happens? You'll predict heads will come up because there's a 60% probability of that occurring. So you predict heads. I flick it again, it's an independent event, well, you make the same bet, right? A third time, you make the same bet, right? 10 times, right? Something smelly, right? This is, this is the sequence of the 10, oh, sorry, this is the single sequence of 10 flips of this coin which has the highest probability. But intuitively, you can smell that something is wrong here, right? Because you're expecting 
40% tails in there. And indeed, if I flip one of these heads to a tail, my total probability does go down. And the mistake is thinking that we live in the world where the most probable thing happens. You know, this is like common sense. This is not how the world works. And what your intuition is telling you is that these two distributions don't match up. So you've got your generative distribution is what you expect it to happen. 60% heads, 40% uh, tails. And you can express that as this histogram or this density here, which says this event heads has a probability of occurring of 60%, and tails here are 40%. And what I saw was 100% tails. So your intuition that something is smelly here is that these two distributions are not the same. There's some, there's some difference between them. And to get a mathematical handle on that, we have to take a step back, and we have to talk about unexpectedness. Like the fancy pants word is self-information. Uh, but all it is, is if you have an event which has a particular probability p, minus log 2 of p gives you the unexpectedness of that event. So if you have an event which has got a probability of 1, it's totally not unexpected. So it has an unexpectedness of 0. If I flip my coin and it comes up heads, there's a probability of 0.6, so it's over here. It's not really unexpected. 40%, slightly more unexpected. If I flip the coin and it quantum tunnels through the floor in front of my feet, well, that's kind of unexpected, right? So it's got a... It can happen, but it's got a very high unexpectedness. So that's like the, the first unit of that. Now, that's a single event. But let's talk about collections of events or distributions. If I have many events, I can describe it as a distribution. And if I take the average of this unexpectedness, that log 2 of p, over the whole distribution weighted by the probabilities, so minus p log p, I get this thing called entropy. Fancy word for unpredictability. So it says, if I have a distribution, what's the unpredictability of drawing things out of that distribution? So if I have, you know, uh, equality-loving American money, 50-50 uh, chance heads or tails is totally unpredictable when I flick it. Will it be a head or a tail? There's no, there's no edge in gambling on that. Whereas like, with my English money, it's slightly more unpredictable. So it's, unpredict so it's entropy, uh, sorry, it's slightly less unpredictable. It's more predictable. It's, yeah, triple and double negatives always trip me up, right? So this thing is slightly more predictable, so it's got a lower unpredictability and therefore a lower entropy. My coin, which came up 100% of the time, it's totally predictable, so it's got an entropy of zero. So in summary, minus p log p gives you the entropy of a distribution, which tells you how unpredictable draws from that distribution are. And you can say, OK, I can see now these distributions have some difference between them. Can I get a closer handle on that? And indeed, you can with a thing called relative entropy. So this is the last mathematical slide, I promise. Right? So instead of minus p log p, it's just p log p over q, where you have two distributions. This is distribution p, that is distribution q, and you average over each element from that. So to get the relative entropy between these two things, it's p log p over q, where like 0 point, so it's 0 0.6 times log 0 0.6 over 0 0.6 plus 0 0.4 times 0 0.4 over 0 0.4, right? Those come out as zero. So the distance between these two distributions is zero, as you'd expect, because they're the same distribution. If they're different distributions, the number comes out as a positive number. So like long story short, this is the lead. This is the, the important thing. Relative entropy is a simple equation and it allows me to t take the distance between any two distributions of any parametric form. It doesn't have to make any clever, clever assumptions about them, provided they're over the same space. So it allows me to ask very general and open questions about distributions. OK, so that's the summary. Entropy is the amount of unpredictability of a distribution. And relative entropy is the distance between two distributions on the basis of their unpredictability. OK, so that's the, the mathematical abstraction. So we've got some, some cool maths. So that's like the science part of the data science. Let's now see how do we express this in closure. So I have some closure over here. Here's some I cooked earlier. And uh, it's, of course, Emacs is going to fight with me now. Come on, Emacs. You know you want to. Um, can everyone sort of see that to some extent? Yeah? So OK, let's, let's go through it. Um, and I, I can't actually see this on my own screen, so I'm going to have to rearrange things a moment here. OK, so let's start off by getting some something on my screen. OK, so let's start off with some random numbers. I have a million random numbers, and they're in this vector called p's. And I want to say, well, how would I calculate the entropy of that, that, that collection? The most naive thing to do is to say, OK, first, let's define a function entropy, which is just p times log p, direct translation from the mathematics. And now I want to go over the entire distribution. So map entropy over p's and then reduce with plus. So that's sigma p log p, all right? Um, and if I, take, if I benchmark that, up until yesterday, I had a somewhat different code, which just said time in the front there. But uh, uh, Zach Tellman taught me, taught me better. So if you actually run proper benchmarks, you'll see that on average, that takes 50 milliseconds to run over a collection of a million. 
And I say, okay, well, that's nice. Let's try and do it a little bit faster. So the closure gives me a handle, which says, okay, I can actually use native Java arrays to make it faster. So the code changes slightly. Here it is. It's the same thing. It's expressing a reduction over the collection piece, right? Uh, whoops. One-handed Emacs, nice, okay. So you get the element from the, the collection and reduce over, it's adding it to the, the accumulator res. If I, try, if I benchmark that, you can see I've halved the time to about 25 milliseconds. If that's not good enough, we can use the most awesome reducers, ooh, reductors, no, reducers, the reducers library, and that gives me access to the fork join queue. So I can take this thing, break it up, put it onto a fork join queue, and use all of the cores. I mean, this is, this is a laptop, right? And it has like eight virtual cores on it. This is like, we've got to get, get real with this. Um, reduces gives me that power, and I can take the calculation time down to eight milliseconds. That's a huge reduction, I mean, absolutely massive. Um, and Clojure gives me that handle. So I can write my maths cleanly, and I can make it go quickly. And that's, that's, that's huge. So to compare it, oh, yeah, there's another one. I could try and look at the, the native Java implementation. So, so, so Clatrix is a JBLAST wrapper, but because this is a linear time operation, it doesn't actually go off the JVM, it actually writes it in Java. And so this is an expression. What it does is it takes my, what I've done, I've taken my, my million numbers, turned them into a column, and then uh, I've applied log element-wise to that collection, and then taken the dot product between P and log P. So it's just a different way of expressing the same maths. Dot is kind of like a mathematical reduce. When I benchmark that, I get 25 milliseconds, which is exactly the same number as I got when I wrote the, the, the Java array reducer, which is what you'd expect. If I compare it with, with stuff that's available out there, MATLAB, you know, 12 milliseconds. So on a single core, it absolutely smokes us. And that we should expect, because it's able to, to call, out, call out to Fortran natively. But because it's only single-threaded, and I can call on eight threads, eventually I can kick its ass, right? <laughs> R, 60 milliseconds is slow, and Mathematica at seven, seven seconds, it's not a fair comparison because it's doing everything symbolically. I would put Python in here, but I don't actually know Python well enough to put a benchmark up, and I would hate to be called out and have nasty things said about me on the internet. <laughs> so, so that's like, okay, I, this, the point of this slide is to say, okay, I can express the maths cleanly, and I can make it go quickly. So now let's um, uh, take the next step. Let us... Uh, Look at, uh, excuse me one moment. How would I actually define that? That's like timings. So now here's my, uh, I've made a namespace called entropy, and I've got the same thing in the entropy, and a, a function bits, uh, native uh, log function is base 10, so I just need to convert all my answers to base two, so they're expressed in bits, so you can ignore that. Uh, and I've got two main functions, entropy, which is the entropy of a distribution, and that's using the same code I showed you earlier, using the reducers. And then, you know, I was talking earlier about language constructs and how important that is, you know. So closure gives you pre and post conditions. So I can easily mix my maths with some production type stuff like pre and post conditions and improve the quality of my code. I can define relative entropy. You know, for giggles, I've done that using JBLAS. And uh, it's the same thing. It's like, uh, here's a function, remember it's p log p over q, and that's expressed very cleanly here. So you divide p by q, take the log and the dot product, sigma p log p log over q. So, the way these functions work is they take in a collection of numbers p and they calculate the density of that. So the density is just a map that says how many times each element occurred in p. Right, very simple. So here are my two functions. Right, um, the point of this slide was simply to show these things, to show that closure gives you beyond normal mathematical stuff more powerful language features. Now let's connect it to some data. So, uh, uh, set up db. Funny, you should, would you expect me to use Datomic in my uh, demonstration? Yeah. So I've got a very simple example here. So I've, I've, I've displayed some maths. I've displayed how to write code about it. Now let's make it real and connect to some real data. So I've got a very simple problem here. Let's say I'm running a bunch of servers that produce responses. And I want to know when things are getting freaky on my server farm. So I have a simple database. It's got one entity, which is a response. It has two attributes, which is, ooh, that's romantic. Um, <laughs> I mean, a man who loves his work, but honestly. Uh, it's got two attributes, which is the server, which produced the response, and the time of the response in milliseconds. So just the simplest thing I could do. I don't want to get trapped up in all the complexity of databases. So that's a very simple thing. And you know, I've made some data, and I've put it into the database. So let's go have a look at uh, some queries over that. Ooh, uh, hmm. OK, so I connect to my database. Uh, see if that's working, yeah, okay. 
That was a false, that's a bit worrying. Okay, and now let's ask some, some, some standard questions. So I have, I have this data in my database, and I want to see, you know, is something going wrong? So what I can do is I can grab all the responses. So this is a query, it says get me all the responses, uh, the, the, the times, then aggregate up, this is a new feature in Datomic, it's kind of cool. So you can aggregate by server ID, and the collection of response times that you get in pass into the average function. So if I do that, um, if you look at the bottom, that's the answer that comes out. So it says, I've only got four servers, so I could fit it nicely into the mini buffer. Server one had a mean response time of 50, two of 50, three of 50, and four of 50. So the means of these things are pretty much the same. I can do the same trick and look at the variance. Um, and they're all roughly the same as well, between 90 and 100. So the point here is, I'm asking a closed question. I'm, I'm asking something very specific about these distributions. Are the means different? or well, the variance is different. This is like highly specific. I'm assuming things about these distributions. And as you can expect, like if I ask relative entropy, that's a much more open question to ask because it doesn't assume anything about this stuff. So how would I do that? Well, I'm going to take rel the relative entropy to the population. So I'm going to say, OK, sigma p log p over q, I'm comparing two distributions. p is my, my population. So if I take all of the responses that I've got in my database and then compare the responses from each individual server and measure the relative entropy between the two of them. So my earlier slide, the population is the red distribution at the top and the blue ones at the bottom are each individual response. I can work that out. So how do I express that in closure? Well, here's the atomic query that gets all of the response times. And then I partially apply that to relative entropy. So relative entropy, you'll remember, perhaps this will even work. Yeah, how about that? Relative entropy, it's a function. It's got two arguments and the, the two distributions. P is my, my distribution over the response times of all the servers. So I've bound that in. And then I give it a name. So I just bind that to the function relative entropy. And now here's, here's the lead. I can now take this function and pop it directly into my Datomic query. So now Datomic has got my, my, my data locally. And I can pass this to my function using reducers or native JBLAS, whatever it is. And it, like, it just meshes together. It integrates. And that's like unparalleled power. So let's have a look. Let's see what does it look like. Um, OK, so the difference from 1, the entropy of 1 is uh, 0.3, 2 is 0.3, 3 is 10, and 4 is 0.2. Do you think I've cooked these numbers so that it comes out this way? <laughs> right? So there's something on. Something's going on with, with server number 3. At this point, I don't know what it is. But because I'm in an interactive environment, I can just uh, pop up densities. So uh, 3 is different. So let's look at what the distribution of 1, 2, and 4 are. So I get my query from my database. I just um, change its format slightly, calculate the density, and then view it. And it looks kind of like a normal distribution, right? So now let's see what uh, ooh, let's see what number three looks like. This is the one that had the faulty answer, right? So let's have a look. I'll just change it up. I can interact with my data. This is the point. I can play, see things, and oh my, look at that! Um, what question do I need to ask of data to say is this thing bimodal? Like, how would I even frame that question initially? Whereas something like relative entropy, just it just pops out. This distribution doesn't look like the other distributions. And that's kind of like a, an awesome thing for, for data science, because that's the kind of questions you want to ask. Like, you know, is something freaky going on? Like, what's interesting? What's different? And this is by asking relative entropy type questions, you can ask that very cleanly and openly. OK, so that's my demonstration. And uh, let's go back. Oh, let's go back, I said. Right. Um, so in summary, you can take a pretty abstract concept like relative entropy. You can express it cleanly in the mathematics enclosure. You can then get a handle to make it go quickly. You can put it on a platform, connect it up to data. You can take the data, you can interact with it, all in one platform. And that is like the power to rule the universe. <laughs> well, maybe, in my mind. <laughs> right. So the ladder enclosure is slightly different to the other ones. It's got the same number of rungs, but unlike the rest, it goes all the way to the top. The trade-off is that the distance between the rungs are higher. So it's slightly harder to do each particular thing, but it gets you from, from all the way at the bottom to all the way at the top. What's missing? Like native libraries, by me, which I mean um, closure native libraries. We need a lot more work and stuff in there. You can get at stuff on the JVM, but it's kind of ugly and non-idiomatic. We need more of that, particularly in things like optimization and statistics. Numerics, we have no hope, right? Like that's kind of a trick by, by using the, the, the multi-threadedness. Um, because we're on the JVM, we're never going to get native fast numerics. And that's just like something on the JVM you're going to have to deal with. It's just a, a trade-off that's been made. So what's the future? In the near term, more libraries and ports. Um, hopefully, uh, that's, that's going to be produced as people start to use this more and more. 
Session, which is a great library from Kovas. I'm not going to steal his thunder, but that, integrated with what I'm talking about, is incredibly awesome. Encanto 2.0, I think Encanto could be like a, one of the killer apps on Clojure, and it's, it needs a bit of love at the moment, so I'm hoping that that'll pick up. In the medium term, what can be done? Probabilistic programming, kind of my bugbear. So probabilistic programming is, well, what logic programming is to uh, deduction, probabilistic programming is for inference. So instead of having variables that are logic variables, they're random variables. So they're drawn from sets and associated with them are probabilities. So each variable represents one of those distributions that I put up earlier. And you can then ask probabilistic operations of it, like to, to marginalize or condition. And these sorts of things, if you can express them cleanly in closure, would be a massively powerful tool. Now there's an implementation that exists in Scheme, of course, called Church, which we could use as a template for that. And you know, I'm told that there are also things in, in uh, Ckunrin and Minikunrin that allow us to, to do this. So I think some, some uh, attention and work there would yield massive dividends. So if this is also awesome and cool, like who's actually doing it, right? Here's a company, it's called Zen Robotics, it's based in Finland. And uh, what they do is they buy these robotic arms, just the hardware from Germans, and they fit them out with AI. So what they do is uh, they sort recycling. So the, the robot at the top there has a camera on it, and the, uh, the belt below goes by with recycling waste. And it separates out plastics and metals and all those sorts of things. And the whole thing is done in closure. There's 130,000 lines of closure in this company running these robots. And that's like the biggest closure company no one's ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've just raised uh, 13 million euros uh, to, 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 to scale out. And you know, I, for one, welcome my uh, robotic overlords that are high on Lisp, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant, right? But this is kind of like where, where we are at the moment with, with this closure ecosystem. It's like for the, the wizard level problems, it's a very, very compelling story. But for, for lower level type stuff where libraries exist, we're not really there yet because people can easily reach out to something like Python and get the stuff done there. And if we make it easy to reach out to closure, we will enable them to make much higher and, and more difficult analyses possible. So finally, uh, just a quick punt myself. This uh, new collaboration uh, between uh, Christoph Grand, Michael Brandlmeier, Sam Aaron, and myself called Lambda Next. And we're going to be providing some uh, closure training and consulting services in Europe. So I hope uh, if that would be useful and helpful to you, you'll reach out to us. Thank you very much. <laughs>